Uh, so would someone be willing to read uh, verses 18 through 25? Uh, we'll read the whole passage and then we'll break up. You want to do it, Toby? Thank you. The birth of Jesus Christ came about this way after his mother Mary had been engaged to Joseph. It was discovered before they came together that she was pregnant from the Holy Spirit. So her husband Joseph, being a righteous man and not wanting to disgrace her publicly, decided to to divorce her secretly. But after he had considered these things, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, don't be afraid to take Mary as your wife, because what she has been conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you are to name him Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. Now all this took place to fulfill what was spoken by the Lord through the prophet, See, the virgin will become pregnant and give birth to a son, and they will name him Emmanuel, which is translated, God is with us. When Joseph woke up, he did as the Lord's angel had commanded him. He married her, but did not have sexual relations with her until she gave birth to a son and named him Jesus. All right, thank you. So, of course, this is uh, this section and the next chapter are probably ones that we hear so often. I mean, we, we love the, the nativity stories and um, certainly we have in, in our churches and our experience of the, the Christers. You ever heard of Christers? Uh, the Christmas and Easter Christians, the ones who, yeah, who only come on those two days. And then they get offended when you say, see you at Christmas. <laughs> yeah, that's you right. See and see you at Easter. Easter. They, they get upset when you do that. I and, understand. And, and so this, you know, these stories get, uh, they, they get, you know, Everyone says they know them because if you are a Christian or at least claim to be a Christian, you've heard these stories around Christmas uh, or Easter, but in this particular one, it's Christmas. And so I want to take the time to unpack what's going on here. Um, I'm sure many of you have done that already, but it certainly doesn't hurt to go through. Um, let me first look at these first, the verses 18 through 20. Of course, uh, you know, he's telling us here about the birth of Jesus uh, when his mother Mary. So if you remember, we just looked at the... Um, the genealogy of Jesus. So we know that uh, Jesus is descended from Abraham uh, through his, uh, his stepfather, if you will, his human father, Joseph, um, who, of course, was uh, wedded or engaged to, uh, to Mary. Um, and it's important here that the, the verse and this whole section is talking about the, I guess what, I guess the Catholics might call the Immaculate Conception, uh, that Jesus was <laughs> was birthed from, from a, a virgin. Uh, and that's something that's very important. We need to talk about that, the virgin birth of Jesus. And, and they, Matthew is stressing this point. This is an important point, which is why it's an important doctrine for us to assent to. If um, there are people out there who claim to be Christians who don't believe in the virgin birth, um, and yet for Matthew, it's a very important doctrine, and not just Matthew alone, I would say the whole church, but uh, especially here in this gospel, uh, Matthew highlights that he was born of a virgin at least three times, I think, if I, through this whole passage here. And the first one is here in verse 18, before they came together, she was found to be with child by the Holy Spirit. And of course, he's talking there about the, that conjugal union that a, a husband and wife have before they came together, but before they had sex she was found to have been impregnated. Now, of course, that's something scandalous, and we see that here. You know, Joseph, being a righteous man in verse 19, didn't want to disgrace her, uh, and so he wanted to put her away discreetly. So what had happened on human terms was very clear, at least to Joseph's mind, in, before he received the revelation from the angel. It was very clear that his, uh, his fiancé must have had an adulterous relationship with someone else. That's the only way that uh, she would have ended up pregnant before the two of them came together. Um, and it, by all rights within the system, he could have had her disgraced. He could have. Um, you know, that today people break engagements all the time. Uh, back then, the engagement was actually an important part of the whole wedding as well, the whole part of the nuptials. You, you wouldn't have. You would not have gotten engaged if you did not intend to actually get married. Uh, all of those things were connected. And so to break the engagement or to commit an adulterous relationship while engaged is just as serious 
as committing an adulterous relationship with your husband or your wife. Um, and so that's a, that's a very important thing to remember in the context of the first century of Joseph's time. What, what Mary had done in his eyes, in his human eyes, was disgraceful, and by all rights, he could very well have brought her, uh, you know, kind of like the Pharisees, how they brought before Jesus back in John chapter uh, is it eight, the woman who had, who was, you know, had an adulterous relationship and, you know, they wanted to stone her. They were all within their well rights, within their legal rights to do so. So they could have stoned Mary? Legally, they, they could have, yeah. She, she could have been punished for, for what she had done. But Joseph, being a righteous man, which means this is, again, righteousness is not a work that we build up to. Righteousness is a gift from God. In human terms, he absolutely had every right to do that. But by God's grace, he gave to Joseph the understanding that it's probably best to just let me, let me say, okay, I want to set you aside. We won't, we, won't, we won't discuss this. We won't bring this to light. You go your way. I'll go my way. That was, a, that was a gift of God. Joseph didn't have to do that. That was by God's righteous gift uh, to give to him. Thankfully, verse 20, an angel stops him. But when he had considered this, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him. And this angel tells him, you know, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife, for that which has been conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. So here's the second time that we learn about the Immaculate Conception of Christ. First, we hear about it by Matthew, the narrator. Now, Joseph hears about it. He finds out about it by this angelic message. And we hear it again uh, the second time there. Um, and so we see that how the important this is. And now the angel is going to go in in verses 21 through 23 and just expand on who this is. Um, you know, she's going to bear a son. Uh, his name is going to be Jesus. Um, this is an important name. If you think about the word Jesus, the name Jesus, it's a, a, it's a, a version of the name Joshua, Yeshua, uh, which means to save. Joshua is, is a word mean or God saves the God uh, my the Lord saves I think is the is that the full translation of Joshua the Lord saves. The Lord saves. Oh, that's what my Bible. This is yeah. Bible says, God of salvation. God of salvation. Yeah, yeah. So very similar. And so we see here even within Jesus's name we're hearing so much about what Jesus is is going to do. So again, for us as Gentiles. And 2,000 years later, we're hearing this story and we know the other story. Think about Matthew's first hearers. Remember, his audience is Jews, uh, especially you know, folks who, who he wants to have eyes opened to understand that Christ was the Messiah. Um, so these are folks who would have known the histories. They would have known the stories and they would have known what Jesus or Yeshua would have meant. Um, and so the very fact that he starts uh, highlighting these things tells us the important role of what Christ is. We see the genealogy, which again, any good Jew would look at it and say, aha, uh, that's, a, that's a good pedigree there. Um, and we'll see here, you know, here's with, with uh, Yeshua, J Jesus, Joshua, the God, the God who saves, the God of salvation. We're learning so much, especially again, a first century Jew would learn so much about who, who this Jesus is. Um, and of course, we get here to verse 22 and 23. Again, part of Matthew's point, highlighting these things to Jews. Um, now, all this took place to fulfill the prophecy. And he, he says here the prophecy uh, from Isaiah, Behold, the virgin shall uh, be, be a child. She shall bear a son. They shall call his name Emmanuel. He translates that name to God with us. Um, and so we see here that, uh, that Jesus is very much a part of this tradition very much a part of this, uh, this plan that God has for salvation, for redemption. And within the first chapter of his gospel, Matthew is making that point. And then again, here in these last two verses, we, we see the third time that, well, I guess technically, I guess if you get the quote, that's the third time, the fourth time that uh, Jesus has, comes from a virgin there. Uh, Joseph arose, he did as the angel said, took his wife, took her as his wife, and kept her a virgin until she gave birth to a son. Um, so four times, if you include the, prof the prophecy, Matthew stresses the point that Jesus was born of a virgin. Now, why is that? Why does Matthew take the time to tell us that she, he was born of a virgin four times? Curious, why do you all? What have you been taught? 
I'm not looking at my pastors, y'all, shh, for a second. <laughs> Lay people. <laughs> That's that's a that's an aspect for sure. But what what why is it a miraculous then? Or why does it have to be a miracle? Maybe that's another question. I mean, it is miraculous, but it's not just because it's miraculous. And why four times? Well, I don't think the number necessarily matters. I just uh, I just wanted to stress the point that he it, it wasn't he didn't just say it once and it was just a passing thing. It's no, he he's it was just wasn't just virgins. Yeah, because most men didn't marry women that were not virgins mm -hmm. in that day. Mm -hmm. um, not like today. Yeah. Uh, so it's more than just virgins. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Which I'm not going to say. And look at the way yeah, I'm not, yeah. I'm, just, I'm not saying anything either. Because I mean, a lot of guys married virgins. <laughs> this is your people. Remember, like, your people answer this question. <laughs> that doesn't make any sense. But right. I will say, yeah. when she yeah. said four yeah. times, when she said why four times, just a little hermeneutical tip in Bible study. When you see a writer that keeps stressing something over and over and over yeah. again, pay attention to it. Yeah. Because that means they're trying to convey trying something to convey important. Something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I don't think the number matters, but the but, fact that he did it for, yeah, yeah. It, yeah. It, go ahead. Was a, this was written years later. Mm -hmm. And so it was a subject that was questioned. Mm -hmm. I mean, certainly, I mean, that I would say that this that is a true thing, you know, and, and it goes back to what the doctrine of the Immaculate Conception is. I mean, certainly a, anyone would recognize that. OK, that's very that's weird. Yeah. That's how how can yeah, how can a virgin. He wrote it as an apologetic. And, and, and I'm sure there is an apologetic point to it, but it's much more than just apologetics. Yeah, it's it's apologetic. there's there is important doctrine here that, again, like I said, needs to be assented to if we want to be Christians. Well, it's what's connected to the virgin birth. Yeah. Go ahead, Mike. Go ahead and give us the answer. They don't see it. No, nah, that's all right. Well, it was... He was conceived of the Holy Spirit, mm -hmm. not a man's sperm. Sinless mm -hmm. nature. Yep. No sin. And that's the doctrine. That's why the Immaculate Conception is so important. Because he was not conceived by man. That's, and that's the other point here. So it's, yeah, Mike's right. It's not just that she was a virgin. That's, that's an important aspect, but that's not the point. The point is that as a virgin, she was, Jesus was conceived by God himself, by the Holy Spirit, um, God and the Holy Spirit. And this is so important because if Jesus was not if Jesus did not have an immaculate conception, if Jesus wasn't born of the Virgin, if Jesus wasn't conceived by the Holy Spirit, then he would he would have a sinful nature like you and I. If he was just if if he was Joseph's blood or if it was some other you know guy who she slept with blood, he would be no different than you and me. And that would mean if even if he you know the rest of the story is true and he goes to the cross, it would mean nothing. It, it, it would just be a man being receiving the just punishment of his sins. Yeah, he'd be a crazy person because he said he was God. Yeah, and he would be a crazy person. Crazy. And so we see how important we have to, if we, if we want to be Christians, if we really want to say we believe what the Bible says about Jesus, at the very beginning, you know, one, we see Matthew setting up Jesus' genealogy, but then four times he mentions that Jesus was born of a virgin. So one of the, the first doctrines we need to come to assent to when it comes to Christ is that he was conceived by the Holy Spirit. He has a sinless nature in him. And yet he was still born of a woman. He came into this earth so that taking on the form of a man, uh, of course, Paul talks about that, picks that up, and that's in the several of our creeds and confessions. Um, Jesus takes becoming incarnated, God incarnating himself in man. So he still comes, so in a way, half of him comes from the woman. And so in her, Jesus' human nature, or I guess... Where you get the fully man, fully God from is because of that. He had to take on, mm -hmm. Paul says, right, take on the nature of man, the humanity part. Mm -hmm. I think it's Philippians, right? I think Philippians that's right. Chapter two. Yep. And he emptied himself. Yep. Yeah. And so, but to go back to your point, that's why it's so important to have a proper understanding of Genesis chapter 3, the fall of man, mm -hmm. to get 
the full, proper understanding of the sinless nature of Jesus and mm -hmm. why he had to be conceived of the Holy Spirit, like Mike said. Yeah. Because you have man's depraved nature, but then you have the sinless nature of the Son of God. Mm -hmm. And that goes into him being the perfect sacrifice for sin because he had no sin. Yeah. And it goes back also, you mentioned Genesis 3. There we see the promise that well, the say, seed of the woman will be the one who crushes the serpent. It's the first mention of Jesus yep. in the Bible. And, and there again, we, we see that, that she, he has to be born of the woman. Notice that he never says, you know, in, in Genesis, Moses never says the seed of the man. He doesn't, he's not, gee, this, this person isn't coming from Adam. No, he's the seed of the woman. And, and of course, now we have in Matthew chapter one, a virgin woman whose seed will be Jesus. Um, and so we see there's, this is, this is biblical theology right in front of us mm -hmm. in, in, the, in the most layman's way. Very of, important biblical theology. Exactly. So it, I just want to stress the point that it is so important that, G, that we believe that Jesus was born of a virgin, that Jesus was the immaculate conception, as uh, you know, like I said, that, that's well, the, the cult, Catholic doctrine. Every cult uh, mm -hmm. in America, in the world, mm -hmm. every religion in the world, with the cults added, and liberal Christianity mm -hmm. denied the virgin birth mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and incarnation of Christ. Yeah, which, I mean, is, which is heresy. Yeah, uh, the the Muslims, Islam believes Jesus was a prophet and he did all these good things, but this is one of the doctrines that. They say there's no way Jesus can be God because they don't they don't it's believe in the immaculate John 4, conception. It's test the spirits. Right? Mm -hmm. John says mm -hmm. if someone denies Christ, then they have the spirit of the Antichrist. Mm -hmm. That's what I like about John. John doesn't. John doesn't. He, he doesn't mince words. Yeah. <laughs> he says he does. He just punches you in the mouth. Yeah. He says he says if you say you love God but you hate your brother, you're a liar. Mm -hmm. The love of God's not in you. I love that. Matt, we just went through the book. I'm sorry. Go ahead. I'll, 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 I preached that book, man, years ago at my church, and people was as red as his shirt. They were so angry. How dare you call me a liar? Well, I'm not calling you a liar. God is. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. God need to have a conversation. It's like, go ahead. Yep. A any other questions on chapter one? We'll, we'll breeze on to chapter two, but well, I want to make sure. I want to ask your opinion on this. Yeah. You notice that when you get through chapter two, and then chapter 3 starts John the Baptist, and of course he goes on mm -hmm. to, to Jesus' ministry. Do you think Joseph died early? Because there's no mention of Joseph anymore after chapter 2. I'm just curious, because he's never, never mentioned again. Well, some mother said that they don't use his name. He's the the son. Son. They call him the Carpenter's son. Right, but I mean... So they knew his father. Yeah, you know, I think that's an extra biblical. It is. I don't think it's. Serious. It doesn't matter. I don't obviously. think it matters doctrinally. Um, do you think he died early? I've always assumed he was alive and then maybe died later on in Jesus's because because of that that he's known as the carpenter's son. Right. He wasn't um, at the cross. Yeah, he but he wasn't, wasn't at the, the cross. cross. And you're right. His name doesn't really appear in any of the other gospels after, after the birth. I, mean, I get it. He's alive through twelve. Yeah. Yeah. Right. But it's. 13 is when they had their yeah yeah, yeah. So when they became right a man right? yeah yeah and they started to study but he never of course never studied under a rabbi yeah so. I mean it's 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 possible certainly by the time you get to that you know Jesus becoming a man and being you know 12 there is no need theologically that speaking and certainly within a Jewish theology there's no need for Joseph at that point right uh, the genealogy is doesn't necessarily matter because now Jesus is his own man um, yeah, I was just curious I just yeah. wanted to get your opinion on it yeah I mean it's a good question like I said I maybe he died I think he died yeah. right after the whole he's in the temple yeah and at 12 I think he's yeah. not around because like you said mm -hmm. why would he not be at the cross yeah with Mary the crucifixion he's most likely been gone because Jesus Asked John to take care of his mother. Yeah, right? yeah. He's still there. Yeah, yeah. That would have been yeah. necessary. Yeah, that's good. true. That's a good point. So yeah, so look at that. We I got some Bible readers here. Good. Presbyterians one. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Episcopal Episcopalian one. <laughs> there you go. There you go. There you go. Got it all. So one third for all three of those. But the important note is that Genesis three Genesis three prophecy is being fulfilled. 
Yes, we have Matthew. Ab yes. Absolutely. That's a great yeah. point. Uh, Matthew 1, one. yeah, Matthew yep, one. yep. And, and so we see, you know, like I said, there are at least, I think at least 60 prophecies that Matthew quotes or, or, or points to, but there are plenty more that he doesn't, which, you know, Genesis 3 would be one of those. 16 or 60? 60, at least 60, yeah, yeah. What's that large? Yeah, I know. <laughs> Is it at least 60? I, I, I think I heard somewhere there might be 62, but I don't, I don't actually, I didn't count it, so I don't know. I heard 60, but I didn't think the book All right, um, we're, we'll move on to chapter 2. Would someone be willing to read verses 1 through 12 for me, the visit of the Magi? <laughs> you do a Barbie? All right, thank you. Thanks, Toby. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea, during the time of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, Where is the one who has been born King of the Jews? We saw his star in the east and have come to worship him. When King Herod heard this, he was disturbed and all Jerusalem with him. When he had called together all the people's chief priests and teachers of the law, he asked them where the Christ was to be born. In Bethlehem in Judea, they replied, For this is what the prophet has written. But you, Bethlehem, and the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For out of you will come a ruler who will be the shepherd of my people Israel. <clears throat> then Herod called the Magi secretly and found out from them the exact time the star had appeared. He sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and make a careful search for the child. As soon as you find him, report to me so that I too may go and worship him. After they had heard the king, they went on their way, and the star they had seen in the east went ahead of them until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they were overjoyed. On coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother Mary, and they bowed down and worshipped him. Then they opened their treasures and presented him with gifts of gold and of incense and myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, they returned to their country by another route. All right. Thank you. So there's, uh, again, here another part of our Christmas story, uh, but uh, so there's a lot of theology here as well and some glimpses that uh, hopefully we'll, we'll unpack. The first thing I want to highlight is something that's not very, you know, you don't have to, doesn't have to shatter your doctrine. Uh, these wise men never appeared at Jesus's birth. Uh, the day that he was so all of our manger scenes and all of our Christmas pageants where the wise men appear that didn't happen at that time. Uh, verse one tells us that after Jesus was born, and then verse eleven tells us they came into the house and saw Jesus. Now again, does that mean every church that has a pageant with the wise men is apostate? No, absolutely not. Just just recognize that the, the wise men weren't there with, you know, the shepherds. Uh, they weren't there at the manger, but they did come. So that, you know, to, to say that to, if, some, if a church were to say, oh, the Magi were never there, well, that would, that would be a red flag, but it's, it's not concerning. But historically speaking, it's, he, they, they weren't there at the manger. Uh, so I want to dispel that first. So they actually in Bethlehem. It says here that Herod asked, where is he going to be born? Mm -hmm. In Bethlehem. And then they go out and they follow the star mm -hmm. and they go to the house. Mm -hmm. Is the house back in Nazareth or is the house, where is the house? Well, it doesn't say it, they went to Bethlehem. It doesn't say. Herod said yeah. go to Bethlehem, but they follow the star. They don't follow Herod's word. And they use a different word there. It's a babe Christ. Yeah. And then they have a child. Yeah. So... And he was a little bit older. He was at least two years old. Yeah. When yeah. Age, you know, yeah. Because he was two and under. Yep, two and under. And and of course, at the end of verse twenty-three, which we haven't gotten there yet, but there they tell him to go to Nazareth. So he's not in Nazareth. We know that, but he. So, but we don't know where he is. He maybe he's in Bethlehem. Maybe he's not. Uh, but we know that he hasn't gotten there yet. I don't think the location necessarily matters. Um, it's just the fact that they appear. And this, is, and this is why, because again, theologically speaking, now let's look at who these folks were. Uh, well, here's another thing. We don't know if there were three of them or not. There are only three gifts mentioned, uh, but in all reality, there were probably more than three wise men. Uh, in fact, there was probably an entourage of people, uh, because if they were coming from the east, so, you know, they, it was a caravan, and, and they probably traveled from place, 
at, at closest Persia, and at, which is, you know, Iran, at, at furthest, it would be a place where India is. So this is, that's roughly about where they're coming from. Um, and that's a long, a long journey. And you, you wouldn't have just packed up one camel with three guys and they would have gone. No, it would have been a caravan. It would have been a, a huge thing. So maybe there were three of them. I don't know. I think there's actually more of them there. They just bought the... Matthew just highlights these three, the three gifts. gifts. They're important gifts. Yeah, well. they're important gifts, which we'll, we'll touch on in a moment. So um, let's, who these Magi are, according to my footnote here, it's supposed to be pronounced Meiji. 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 I've always thought it was Magi. I always thought it was Magi. That's just from the movie The Mummy. Though. Yeah. So like, I'm just, yeah, I'm, I'm, yeah. But anyway, my, my footnote tells us these this was a group of, of wise men who specialize in astrology and medicine. So wise men, astrologers, uh, these are all ways of, of noting. The, the fact that the point that Mar Matthew is telling us here is first and foremost, these are Gentiles. They are magi, 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 astrologers. These are, these are non-Jewish theologians. Okay, these are not, let me say, they are not Jewish theologians. They don't believe in... <clears throat> they might not even know about the oh, God of Judaism. Know, yeah. We don't know that. We don't know. We don't know, know that. They may have been proselytes because and, the Jews mm -hmm. had lived in Persia for hundreds of years. That's true. And before they the Babel. They yep. studied the Old Testament mm -hmm. scriptures because how would they know mm -hmm. about the prophecies if mm -hmm. they weren't studying the Old Testament prophets? Yeah. That yeah. he would be born. Yeah. And there would be signs. They were his. very well educated. Now. They were very well educated. And, and I think that's the point is these are folks who, the, these are you know, learned folks who, who have heard about the prophecies, but now are coming to, to meet it. They're, they are Gentiles still, even though they're proselytes. Yeah, like they're, Cornelius was. Yep, and, yep, and Cornelius. And to see if it was true. And it's possible, yep. Well, if I wanted to see if it was true, yeah. And I think what we see here is, again, God's grace in action. This is God's sovereign work here. It was God who gave these wise men, whether proselytes or not, the wisdom, the insight to look at his word and to follow that star, to look at the sky and to be stargazers, uh, which, of course, you know, in the Old Testament, astrology is something that's frowned upon. Um, and here we see folks that would be outsiders, by all intents and purposes, are coming to Christ the Messiah, coming to worship him, tells, tells us Matthew. Again, this is something, this is God's grace, God's action at work here in the lives of these, of these folks and wise, lives of these magi. Um, they've, they've come, they understand, but of course, they don't really know where to go. So we see here in verses uh, 3, verse 3, they... Uh, they, or Herod, you know, they come in and, and Herod finds out about them. And Herod, and this is interesting, Herod was troubled and all Jerusalem with him. And it's a, a very interesting turn of phrase there. Uh, now, of course, I don't think Matthew is saying every single person in all of Jerusalem was, was upset with Herod. Uh, heard about it and heard their request. It, 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 this is, again, I think it's just a way of, of highlighting the, the magnitude of, of Herod's raid, rage, essentially. Uh, of course, Herod, being a king, represents his people. And in a way, here, again, this is all Jewish language, Jewish ideas. Uh, the, the David stood for uh, the people of Israel. Saul did as well. In a way, Herod stands for his people. And what we're seeing here is that not only is Herod blinded, so is Jerusalem. That's, that's Matthew's point. There are so, ma so many have been blinded by the Pharisees, by the, by the Sadducees, by the, the, the religion of the elites who've taken advantage and who tithe mint and cumin but don't care about righteousness and justice and mercy. And, and that's the, the downfall of, of Israel, if you will, for that time. 400 years between this gospel and, well, I guess 400 years before, between the birth of Jesus and the end of Malachi. So 400 years, there is relative silence, if you will. And so we see here that all that is wrapping up in all of Jerusalem being troubled with Herod. Again, 
I don't think it's every single person on every single street corner, but it's Herod, again, representing his people uh, and the rage that he's going to, um, but also his, um, his waywardness. The, the, the people of God had become wayward. Um, and, and this, and of course, John tells us this. When you go and read the prologue to John, uh, in the beginning was the word where became flesh or, and you know, dwelt among us. And the light, what does he say? The, the darkness doesn't comprehend the light. He came to be light. But no one believed in him. No one came to trust in that light when he was born. So that's, that's John's point. We see that here repeated here. Uh, verses four through six tells us the story of Herod's interaction with, um, uh, with the Magi and uh, Magi and, uh, and his own concern. Uh, and here again, we see the prophecy. Again, one of the prophecies that Matthew points out. Uh, you know, he calls them together, the, pre- the priests and the scribes. So it's interesting where he asks, you know, where is this written? Where, where is this written down? And they have to go and, and hunt it down. It's like they've forgotten or they never knew it. If they were really righteous, they would have, they would have been able to say, oh yeah, it's in Malachi. Here it is. Or Micah. Yeah, they, they knew of the prophecy, they mm-hmm. knew of the Messiah, mm-hmm. that he would be the son of David. Yeah. They knew all those prophecies, but they were not, um, they were not really looking. Mm-hmm. Uh, because there was a sense of messianic, that the Messiah was going to appear. Mm-hmm. Um, why there were so many false ones yeah. that Pilate yeah. took care of that were rising up. Yeah. You know, people were calling them their Messiah. And, yeah. But they weren't fit in the mold. Mm-mm. They weren't sons of David. They were, yeah. you know, they were not born in Bethlehem. Yeah. But uh, it was almost like, a, mm-hmm. it seems like there was like a spiritual dullness. Deadness. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's like today. I mean, mm-hmm. you know, the worldwide church of Jesus mm-hmm. that's the true bride knows we're in the last days. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But yet there are millions, hundreds of millions of people who don't even think we're mm-hmm. in the last days. Mm-hmm. They're just so consumed with their personal lives mm-hmm. and the world around them. They're not even thinking mm-hmm. Jesus is coming. Yeah. And the signs are pointing this way. Mm-hmm. And uh, so I, I, I think that's probably what the case was. I agree. Yeah. Because remember, when Jesus was, mm-hmm. was circumcised on the eighth day, there were two seniors mm-hmm. in the temple that were were uh, cued by the Holy Spirit in mm-hmm. their lives because they were godly Simon and Anna yep in their 80s they mm-hmm. were, and they were told by the Holy Spirit that they would not die until they saw the Messiah yeah and when he they brought the child to the temple mm-hmm. they both felt the confirmation of the Holy Spirit mm-hmm. that this was Child. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, everybody else was like totally dull to it. Yeah, it goes back to that inspiration, that Holy Spirit listening to that. Um, and I think you're right about pointing out that they were looking for wrong messiahs. You know, there were many. You know, it's not that Jesus was the only one who claimed that name. You're absolutely right. There were others. Uh, they allude to it in Acts as well. But all of them were highly political messiahs these were folks who who wanted to overthrow the roman empire and and of course when that's probably what herod was looking for he was looking for you know if someone is a messiah who or claiming to be king of the jews that's threatening his power that's threatening his authority and as a a good heathen he doesn't want that he 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 wants to consolidate his power, uh, and and of course we see here that they're not looking for the true Messiah who is not just the political Messiah, but the one who's going to bring a salvation far better than what would be a salvation from any uh, political political entity. Um, and so they're not looking for him. They they have to go hunt down this this prophecy, and when he finally gets it, you know, new Bethlehem, land of Judah. Not least of the leaders of Judah, for out of you shall come forth a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Herod then secretly calls these magi and tries to ascertain from them when it appears. Um, and he tells them then to go and, and careful search. And here, uh, here he is just being secretive. But this is what I want to stress. And I preached on this at the end of last year. Um, notice here the, the extent that, again, the... The, for us, the believer has when our rulers, when our civil magistrates tell us to do something that is not 
biblical. Here, Herod, certainly well within his rights as king of Israel to ask, or king of Jerusalem, to ask these magi to tell him where this Jesus was, uh, where this child was born. And we know the exact reason why, because he would want to go and destroy this child and consolidate his own power. Of course, we see that as here, they were in verse 12, they were warned in a dream not to return to Herod. They depart their own country by another way. They completely ignore the mandate of, the, of this leader. They completely ignore because the Holy Spirit knew, told them that this was something bad. This was something that would lead to the death of, of Jesus the Christ. But Romans 13. <laughs> and, and so we see that they, they go the other way, even though, you know, this leader, political leader, has, has mandated, asked them to tell him about this Jesus. Um, they don't follow that rule because they know doing so would, would go against God's will because the Holy Spirit has revealed it to them. It's interesting that they had you know, the revelational dreams mm -hmm. in this story. Yeah. Joseph yeah. and the wise men. Whether mm -hmm. they all three had the same dream or one had it. Or, mm -hmm. And they shared, he shared it around the fire. You know, I think we had, I had this nasty dream. I yeah. Know, better go back to and they knew it was from something divine. Yeah. yeah. Right? They yeah. knew it. I bet it was something like that. I mean, that's how you, you know, if they're sharing the story around the campfire and then Joseph's like, well, I had this dream too. And, and it's very similar or something. And yeah, I bet, I bet it was confirmation. I think it's like, you, like, if it's from God, you know it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's different. It's not like, can you discern whether it's your own desire or if it's a godly desire? That's, that's the question, right? Mm -hmm. Can you discern that? Mm -hmm. And I think they knew it was from God. Yeah. Um, Pilate's wife had. Oh yeah, had Pilate's run, wife is like, dream about Jesus. Yeah, mm -hmm. leave this man mm -hmm. alone. He's yeah. plaguing me in my dreams. He's yeah. tormenting me in my dreams. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's so important that we don't overlook the power of, of dreams and that this is a way that God has communicated to, yeah. to his people. The power of dreams that are actually from God, though. That's true. <laughs> Trying to discern, and that's where, that's where we have the scriptures to help us understand and discern. Because, yeah, two... Dreams are not from God. No, you got to no. Right. and some of them aren't. That's right. That's right. Not every dream is from God. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. It's only... you get one from God, you know. I think you know it when you do. Yeah. I think yeah. you know it when you did. Yeah. yeah. My brother, my brother had a dream. He had a dream uh, way back when he was forty-five, and mm. uh, uh, his wife was scheduled for a colonoscopy, the first one. Mm. And so he had a dream uh, of a worm eating him up mm. on wow. the inside. Wow. Wow. And uh, he just blew it off. Mm. And uh, so his wife Angel was scheduled. Mm -hmm. Mm. 30 days go by, he has the same dream. Mm. So he says to her, his wife, he says, you know, honey, I, maybe you should call your doctor and let me take your place. Mm. And since my father and my two uncles had cancer, mm. and to call him, I think maybe, you see if the doctor will switch. Mm. So the doctor said, yeah, sure, with your father, husband's history, mm. yeah, bring him in. So he scheduled them the following month. They found cancer in his colon, wow. the size of a golf ball. Mm. Mm. It was a polyp that yeah. had become cancerous, mm. attached to the wall, and about to hit his liver. Mm. Mm. And it was malignant. So they got wow. it at the top. Yeah. yeah. So Man. they cut the foot of colon out of it. Yeah. And he's still alive. You know, wow. He's like 68. Yeah. And uh, he attributes that to the dream from God. Yeah. Yeah. He yeah. said, if I had ignored that another 30 days, he said, I probably would have died. Sure. Oh yeah. Because it would have went right through my whole body. Yeah. Wow. So yeah. Wow. So he. So when you get a dream, when yeah. You like that, you and you know. Better listen. Listen. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> All right. We got uh, ten minutes. Um, let's uh, let's just go through verse fifteen here, and then we'll pick up with the rest of this half a little bit later. Um, so I'll just finish with these three verses here. Um, now, when they had departed, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream, saying, Arise and take the child and his mother and flee to Egypt and remain there until I tell you, for Herod is going to search for the child to destroy him. 
And he arose and took the child and his mother by night and departed for Egypt. And there was, excuse me, and was there until the death of Herod, that what was spoken by the Lord through the prophet might be fulfilled, saying, Out of Egypt did I call my son. So here, I think this is, we were just talking about dreams, and, and it's very possible, like Mike says, this is this same dream or very similar version was conveyed to the Magi. And maybe, you know, they were all gathered around the, the campfire and, and that was a way to help confirm that message. We don't know, that's, that's all extra scriptural, that's not written down for us, but it, it certainly wouldn't be uncommon, uh, would not, wouldn't be unusual. Um, and of course, here we see that out of Egypt did I call my son. Here's again, this other point that uh, pointing back to another prophecy, Hosea 11, I think is where it's from, uh, that this uh, Jesus is, is to come out of Egypt. And this is also another important significance. Remember, again, for us, we might just gloss over this, but for a Jew, this is vitally important. Because it was out of, it was Egypt, the house of bondage, the house of slavery that God drew their, the people, Israel, out of, his, his children. Uh, the, the Hebrews came out of Egypt. And so we see here again this, uh, and of course, there's so much in the Old Testament that is an image of or foreshadowing of Christ and what he does. And of course, uh, the, the Exodus is, a, is an act of, of liberation, an act of redemption on, the beha on behalf of God for his people, which of course is exactly what Jesus does when he redeems us from our sins. He, he, he pulls us out of this life of death and our slavery to sin and makes us then slaves of righteousness, as Paul says in, in the book of Romans. And so here again, we, we, we see this, the illusion, the connection of what uh, the, if you will, the what Moses as a form of a Messiah, as a, a Christ-like figure, and certainly as God's working with, uh, with the Hebrew people and redeeming them out of Egypt, Jesus also experiences that, that redemption. And we're going to talk whenever we get to chapter three, about the importance of Jesus also submitting to and experiencing these, these prophecies of, of God, uh, because that's an important aspect of his righteousness, which is then imputed onto us. But I think we'll call it quits for now. Are there any questions? Go ahead. Okay. You said 60, maybe more. Yeah. Is that the first one right there? Oh, no, that's not the first. Because uh, the... I don't remember. Read one last week. Yeah, we've, uh, I think there are three prophecies so far. So we, let's keep a tally. <laughs> you keep track of that for me. I think that was the third one. <laughs> I'm sure you can find a chart somewhere. <laughs> yeah. No, don't Google it. Yes, yes, sir. Yeah. Google will tell you the truth. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> They'll censor it. I've got I've got some really good books in my office about all the prophecies mm -hmm. of Christ, and I can bring one next week if you want me to. It just kind of remind me. Yeah. You can borrow it and read it. It's fascinating. And they don't have all sixty of those now. Oh, it'll have more. Than oh, I'm sure it's more because it's <laughs> the other it's gospels. Every single prophecy of Jesus. In the yeah. Yeah. It's pretty cool. Yeah. All right. Any other questions? All right. Well, here none, we'll uh, close with a word of prayer and we'll pick up. Heavenly Father, first of all, I do want to thank you so much for the reminder of who Christ is, not just our, our Savior, our Redeemer, but the very fact that he was conceived by the Holy Spirit. Uh, this is an important truth, Lord, that I pray that your Holy Spirit help us to assent to, to come and trust in, because without that immaculate conception, there would be no Christ. There would be no work of redemption. Indeed, there would be nothing on the cross. So God, I hope and I pray that as we continue to study uh, the book of Matthew, we can come to a deeper sense of who Christ is and, and what he has done for us, what he was called to do. And Lord, I pray that we can then change our lives or, or, or change the way we think so that we can come to trust in him and his work. Lord, we pray all this in the name of Christ, our Savior. Amen. Amen.